Okay, here we are for week 13 of the Vikings, and tonight we're going to look at the Scandinavian Kingdom of England. We're really going to continue what we talked about last week, where we brought England almost up to the Norman Conquest, and we brought Normandy up to the Norman Conquest. And so we're going to look at the Scandinavian Kingdom of England as it was really under King Canute, and then we're going to look at the merging of uh, Norman and Viking, uh, Norman and, and English uh, culture, and I'm going to argue that it's very, very Viking, that, that it's a, it's a, uh, there are huge Viking remnants there. Uh, and I have some new evidence of that for you that I've just, uh, just come across. Um, for the first hour, we'll look at the Scandinavian King of Eng Kingdom of England, and then we'll look at the Bio Tapestry as a Viking document. And I had mentioned to you before that uh, when I went to Denmark, it was everywhere. Uh, the Danes regard at least the ships in it uh, as uh, as totally Viking. And I found some some additional evidence for that that I want to share with you today. And I thought it would be fun to go through as much of the bio tapestry as I was able to, to um, get. And uh, we, could, we can examine it in some detail in the second hour today. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and I have more sources for you to show you. Uh, here's a map that I, that I didn't show you before because I forgot I had it actually, but it's really important. Um, uh, this is a map that shows the ocean currents of the Atlantic, and I'm not sure how clear those ocean currents are, but you can see uh, how important they are. They go from the Atlantic, the, the, the middle Atlantic here, and then the Gulf Stream goes up here, and it goes right around England in both directions. It goes around Iceland. It barely hits Greenland, which is much colder, but then it goes up the coast of Norway. And so the Gulf Stream and all of those currents were very important to Viking navigation. They're also very important to particularly the climate of England, which is quite far north. But in fact, it's relatively warm for the latitude that it's on. And it's because the Gulf Stream goes right around it here. It goes on both sides of England and Ireland. And, and Ireland is especially cold, but um, England is relatively warm. And we, when we left off last time, we were looking at the Kingdom of England um, un under Alfred. We looked at Alfred's England, and we looked at his sons and grandsons, and especially Ethelstan bringing the Kingdom of England together. Really, Ethelstan was the first one who ruled a unified England where you can say he considered himself a kind of emperor, that he was overlord over all of England and, and a lot of the... Um, princes of Wales and Scotland and the Viking lords who were moving down here uh, recognized him as an overlord and he viewed himself as a kind of emperor. And then after Athelstan, who ruled from 924 to 939, it was all downhill <laughs> up until the time of Canute because the, uh, nobody else could hold it together like Athelstan did. Uh, here are some pictures of England, and, and I'm going to show you some just gorgeous pictures of England, and you'll see why the Vikings wanted it so badly, why they kept invading it. Of course, these are summertime pictures, but, uh, okay, this is England. You can see the countryside of England, and sort of some hills, and, and this is a view from one of the English castles. You can see the kind of misty forests and woods and meadows in England and it's beautifully green and lush. And here's a here's another here's a stream in a in a little glen in a forest, a forest glen. And so you can see why why England was so desirable. It was so beautiful for the Vikings. Here's a little Anglo Saxon church with a cemetery in just isolated out in a forest where it would have been um, at this time. So, so England was very desirable for the um, the Vikings. Uh, our sources for England, and, oh, that's the book I forgot. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle again, which is just indispensable from the time of Alfred on through the Norman Conquest. You uh, you want the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle? I believe this is a picture of Alfred on the cover of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. 
and so that is an indispensable source. Uh, the Encomium M.I. Regina, which uh, is, was one of the optional books for this course, um, and uh, this, is, this is the version uh, that I have. Um, uh, this is uh, edited by Alistair Campbell. It's an edition that's put out with a new introduction by Simon Keynes, which is very valuable. Uh, the Alistair Campbell version is older. And so um, this is a, a major, major source. And of course, we were reading for tonight, um, Canute. And uh, this turned out to be a really good book by M.K. Lawson because he, he really integrates a lot of Scandinavian history about the other Scandinavian kings besides Canute into this, so it gives you a lot of good background. And this is King Canute right here. This is a very famous um, um, illuminated manuscript of Canute and Emma. Uh, 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 both touching the cross on, on the cover of this book. Um, the Vita Eduardi Regis is the life of King Edward. It's also written uh, written by um, one of the monks of Sambertan who also wrote the, uh, the life of Emma, the Encomium Emma Regina. And uh, it was commissioned by Queen Edith, who was uh, Edward the Confessor's wife. And I, I forgot to bring that tonight. But that's, a, of course, a major source for uh, what we're looking at tonight. And uh, Order Vitalis, which I brought last week. Uh, this is volume two of a six-volume work. And, and what, is, what is so amazing about Order Vitalis uh, He's writing in Normandy. He was a monk who was writing in Normandy, but he, but his mother was English. His father was Norman. He was born in England after the Norman conquest, and then his father took him when he was ten years old. Took him to Normandy, where he then was in the Abbey of Saint Evroul, and he wrote this this incredible history that comes out to be six modern volumes, and. Um, one of the extraordinary things to me about Orderic's history is it is incredibly personal. It's like a gigantic saga. And he has personal families, uh, personal histories of all the Norman families. You can literally trace hundreds of families through this book. And it, it, it's very Viking. Uh, uh, it's very Viking in its concept. He also, he knew what was going on all over the world. He knew what was going on in the Holy Land on the Crusades, and he knew what was going on in Scandinavia. He knew what was going on in southern Italy and where other Normans were. He knew what was going on in Spain where there were some other Normans. And so he knew everything. But the really extraordinary thing is only one manuscript of this survives. Only one manuscript, and it's the one he wrote with his own hand. So nobody ever copied it. It didn't circulate. It wasn't copied into anybody's library. My guess is because it was too long. <laughs> nobody wanted to copy six volumes. But um, that, there's that only that one manuscript that survives. And so historians have to conclude from that that not very many people read it. Uh, it didn't circulate. And so that's kind of extraordinary, too. There was an earlier author that who Orderick drew on quite a bit, and that was William of Jumiege. And this is volume two. This, this set has two volumes. I just happened to pick up volume two. And it's been newly edited by Elizabeth Van Hoots, who is a marvelous uh, scholar. Uh, the the Justin Norman Norman Dukem is referred to a lot in your book about Canute, and uh, it's it's a it's a history written by William of Jumiege, and it's the the Justin Norman Dukem, the deeds of the Norman dukes, is is what that means, and so it's it's a kind of a family history of the Norman dukes, a very Viking in concept, and but. Later on, I mean, he was writing about 1050, and he sort of spanned the Norman conquest. But then later on, Order Vitalis, who we already mentioned, and another historian, Robert of Torigny, who wrote about 100 years after William of Jumiege, added passages to it, in other words, bringing it up to date. So William of Jumiege is like a mini Order Vitalis, and it circulated very widely. This is the, this is the version of 
the norm in histories that people actually read. And so Orderix, uh, I don't believe anybody actually read it um, except Orderic himself. Uh, speaking of other sources on the Norman Conquest, we might mention uh, the Guest of Guglielmi of William of Poitiers, Poitier, out in a new version, again edited and translated uh, by R.H.C. Davis and Marjorie Chibnall. And Marjorie Chibnall also did Orderic Vitalis. And, and this is almost contemporary to William the Conqueror's um, Conquest of England. And this is the, the Gesta Gilelmi is, is the deeds of William. Uh, and so this is only about William the Conqueror uh, by William of Poitiers. Uh, pretty contemporary to the Conquest. And then this is another very important source, the Chronicle of John of Worcester. This used to be called Florence of Worcester, and I believe in, in our book on Canute, he actually calls it Florence. But uh, scholars now agree that Florence began the chronicle, but it was John who wrote most of it. And so now it's rightly called John of Worcester. I only have volume three. I need to get volume two of this. And, and uh, it's, it's now out in, in, in um, three volumes. And so this is, uh, this is the Latin version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that was written in Northern England. So you see why it's very important for Viking history to, to use John of Worcester. And so these are some of the sources I thought I would show you that uh, Lawson was using in his book that you're reading called Canute. Okay. Now, we got up to Ethelred the Unready last time, and uh, we talked about uh, poor Ethelred. Remember I read you that quote from Warren Hollister who said, poor Ethelred, he wasn't that bad a king. He was just so unlucky. Everything went against him. Everything fell apart. The Vikings started attacking, and they were very efficient in their attacks, and, and Ethelred tried to pay them off, which was good diplomacy. I mean, paying them off kept them from killing everybody and invading, but the Vikings Vikings were too smart to be paid once and go away. They came back to be paid again and again. And if you go through, and, and somebody here might want to do that for your term paper, but go through the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle on Ethelred's reign and add up all the Danegeld he paid. And it's, it's almost 100,000 pounds of gold and silver. I mean, it's incredible the amount of money that he paid, which tells you how very rich England had become by Ethelred's reign. And so this is one reason the Vikings were newly interested in it again, because Alfred had built all those towns, and Alfred had uh, it, it built a navy, and trade and commerce was booming, and so England was becoming richer and richer because of its security and uh, the resources that it had. So when we read the Anglo-Norman, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, we, we see these enormous sums and then the renewal of attacks after a period of peace under Alfred's sons. Well, in order to stem the tide of all of this, uh, all of this uh, Viking invasion, uh, Ethelred the Unready tried to make an alliance with the Normans in Normandy. And so he was already married to a woman called Alfgafu. And you're going to notice this. Um, let me write her name down. He was married first to Alfgafu. And this is spelled in various kinds of ways. Um, Alfgafu, not E. Um, that uh, practically all the queens of England are named Alfgafu, the Anglo-Saxon king <laughs> queens. And so this translates into English as Edith. Um, so Alfgafu is sort of like Edith. However, there, uh, William the Conqueror had a daughter named Alfgafu, and that's usually translated as Agatha, which is kind of interesting um, that the same spelling and the same word is, is translated differently. I guess it depends on whether you're a Norman scholar or an Anglo-Saxon scholar. But he had married this Alfgavu first, and he had some children by her. But then he decided it was important to marry Emma of Normandy because uh, he wanted an alliance with the Normans because uh, some of the kings of Denmark, like Svein Forkbeard, was trying to make alliances with the Normans uh, against the Anglo-Saxons. There was booming trade between England and Normandy at this time, lots of commerce between them. And so at that point, Ethelred made a treaty with Duke Richard II of Normandy, and he married Emma of Normandy, 
uh, well, the daughter of Duke Richard I and the sister of Duke Richard II. The encomium M. I. Regina, as I mentioned, is a major source, and uh, um, uh, uh, Ethelred was appealing to the Normans for help. In 1009, he may well have asked for Norman help against his enemies. Uh, when uh, Ethelred just couldn't hold off the Vikings, uh, Canute the Great ended up uh, getting control of England, but there was, a, there was a, a little bit of negotiation in between. Canute the Great created a North Sea Empire, and we'll sort of come to that, but first we have to look at the background, and the background is the rise of the Danish monarchy, and there aren't very many kings in the line before Canute. Who is the first king of Denmark that we can identify? It's Gorm the Old. And Gorm the Old is the father of Harold Bluetooth. Harold Bluetooth is then the father of the next one in line, Svein Forkbeard. Uh, who uh, Lawson in, in your book on Canute calls Svegen. And you know, all these names are spelled so many different ways that that you can spell them any way and you can pronounce them lots of different ways. I call Svein Forkbeard Svein Forkbeard because that's what I always have called him. But uh, you can call him Swagen if you want. <laughs> and then Svein's son was Canute. And so you can see that the monarchy was not very old by the time Canute uh, um, inherited the, the kingship of Denmark. All right, here is Ethelred the Unready, Ethelred Unread, and here is his portrait on his, on his coin, and um, uh, it's kind of hard to read. Ethelred, and in here there's a, there's a D symbol, which is a TH, remember, can you read that? Ethelred Rex, okay, and here is the the reverse of his coin, but we can see a little portrait of Ethel Red. And here is Emma, and she is receiving a letter at this point, uh, and uh, possibly it is the marriage contract for her to go to England. We don't know for sure. I mean, here is the picture. You have to figure out what it is. And monks are showing her a letter. A messenger is showing her a letter. And here she is in a ship going to England. This could be either a Norman or an Anglo-Saxon ship. They both looked pretty much alike. But she's sailing across the channel and going to England. And we have this Viking oar in her ship. And here is a coin of Canute, who she then married next after Ethelred died. And has anybody read the encomium M. I. Regina? Anybody read it for their term papers? No, the encomium M. I. Regina? Nobody's read it? No, okay. Oh, well, I'll, I'll mention something about it uh, when we get to it. Okay, and anyway, here is uh, Canute, and here you can read it. C-N-U-T Rex, Canute Rex, Anglorum. Okay, so here is, and here is all the money that England has, the incredible wealth. Here's a gold hoard of money. Uh, Harold, uh, wait a minute, which Harold are we talking about? Here we're talking about Harold Bluetooth. Harold Bluetooth's building campaigns imply that there was a system for organizing labor. And some of the things that, uh, there, there seems to be a huge building campaign in Denmark under Harold Bluetooth that suggests that he was really organizing the government for the first time because remember that all the Viking kingdoms, they weren't kingdoms yet, they were all very localized and there was no central authority and, and the central authority is pulled together for the first time by Harold Bluetooth. He's able to organize people and build significant structures. For example, the mounds and the early church at Yelling. He reconstructed the Dana which was a great earthwork barrier from uh, across uh, southern Denmark, keeping out the Germans. There's a large bridge at Ravning. And also, the most significant of all, perhaps, are these four gigantic earthworks at Fearcott, Agersburg, Nonabacon, 
and Trelleborg. They're ring forts and surrounded by a huge earthwork. And the evidence seems to be that they're built in the time of Harold Bluetooth, that they are relatively recent, and that they functioned as centers of royal power. So we can see Harold Bluetooth centralizing the kingdom of Denmark, building a kind of administration. And we can see the rise of administrative institutions at the time of Harold Bluetooth. For example, there is a land unit called a Sissel that is perhaps like the English Shire. Remember we saw that, that England was divided into shires or counties, and so Denmark was divided into Sissels. Um, Denmark also had a smaller land unit that the Sissels were divided in called Herods. And this is a land unit obligated to provide military service to the king. It makes me think a little bit of the hundreds of England. Remember that the shires were divided into hundreds in England. There is also a lething, which is a national ship levy, uh, and uh, that uh, could be levied a, a kind of tax to have ships built for the whole country. And all of these institutions seem to have begun, uh, were, they're heard of for the first time under Harold Bluetooth. So he's organizing Denmark for the first time. And Svein Forkbeard, of course, would have inherited that, and so would Canute in Denmark. Um, Svein Forkbeard assembled a large invading army. And one of the things that really struck me as I was reading uh, Lawson's biography of Canute, uh, such as it is, was that the large invading army, the way it was assembled, it resembled very much the army that William the Conqueror assembled to invade uh, Normandy when he did. But here are some of these large structures, and you can see how gigantic these mounds are that are at Yelling. And here is an older, this is a newer church than the one uh, that um, Harold Bluetooth built. And here is one of the ring forts. Uh, this is the one at Trelleborg, and you can see how gigantic it is. Uh, that house is not too far away in the background. I mean, it is really huge and gigantic, and you can see the foundations of the building. And here is the uh, model of what the fort would have looked like. And there were four of these. They were newly built, and, and they appear to be the centers of administrative power. Uh, in the army of invasion uh, for invading England, many leaders of the warriors are mentioned, including practically all the crowned heads of Scandinavia, including Olaf Tryggvason and the future Saint Olaf, uh, who would have been Olaf of Norway. Uh, uh, Olaf Haraldsson is Saint Olaf, a mixed group, more than just Danes, uh, but people from all over Scandinavia. And many people seem to be attracted to the army by the prospect of plunder. There were many freebooters, and some Irish freebooters may have been among them, and perhaps some Normans too. Uh, Svein had regularly visited Normandy, and he visited Rouen shortly before 1013 and agreed with Duke Richard II that the booty taken by the Danes was to be sold through the Normans. And so things are getting really antsy for Ethelred the Unready because his own father-in-law is making a deal with his enemy here, Svein Forkbeard. Uh, the Danish wounded were to be given refuge in Normandy. So by the time of the invasion of England by 1013, um, it, with Canute and Svein uh, invading, they were, they were allied with the Normans. And so Ethelred's days were numbered. Here is the Scandinavian world. And one of the things is that it is so linked together. The Normans and the English are, um, the, the, the Danes and the English and the Normans are all interlinked in the Norse linked up with each other and the Irish and this is a this is an all Scandinavian army that Spain has brought together to conquer. Uh, he conquered very quickly and the whole Kingdom of England submitted. Ethelred at that point went into exile in Normandy with Duke Richard II. But Spain died very quickly on uh, in February 1014 and the English invited Ethelred back and expelled Canute, possibly because he was only about 15 years old at the time, which then, you know, who wants a king who's only 15 years old when you're being attacked by warriors on every side? 
Nevertheless, Ethelred came back because he was an older man, but he was unpopular. He had become king under a cloud, if you remember that his brother had been murdered by his own followers. It wasn't his fault, but he had failed to protect his people from the Viking invasions, and he had spent vast sums of money on the Danegeld paying the Danes off. And also, to get that money, he had confiscated property and, and levied huge taxes on the English, and he was viewed as a unjust, that he was not a just king. Well, Canute waged war largely against Ethelred's son, Edmund Ironsides, who was about the same age as Canute. And uh, this is Edmund Ironsides was the son of Ethelred by his first wife, by the way, Alfkafu. Uh, Wessex submitted to Canute in 1015, and Eadric Strionia and Thorkel the Tall, who were both uh, Danes, they were both Vikings, in the entourage of Ethelred, and they deserted Ethelred at this point and joined up with Canute, bringing 40 ships with them. So you can see how Viking they were. And here is, um, here is uh, Wessex, which was subdued very quickly, and here are the rest of the areas of England, which we'll come to again. When Ethelred died on 23 April, London elected Edmund Ironside king, but Canute already had Northumbria, and Edmund had some success against Canute because Eadric Striona again switched sides to come back, to deserted Canute and went over to Edmund's side, and in 1016 Edmund recovered the Kingdom of England. Um, but he was again defeated by Canute, and at this point, Edmund died. Um, he, he was, it was a pretty equal, equal struggle between Edmund and Canute. If Edmund hadn't died, who knows what would have happened, but Canute was lucky that Edmund died. Canute already had part of the, of the Kingdom of England, and so he was then crowned king. The evidence for his reign is, in fact, very sparse. We've looked at some of it, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the Encomium M.I. Regina. Uh, he did issue a code of laws. He issued a few charters and a few letters. Also, Icelandic poetry. There's some poetry that we can draw on to look at Canute. The encomium itself may have been propaganda or praise written under the Normans after the Norman conquest, commissioned by Emma, and in it, Emma never mentions that she was married to Ethelred. She totally blanks it out. She's rewriting history. And so she saw herself as Canute's queen because Canute was a better king than Ethelred was. So she ignored Ethelred as, uh, as a king. Here is King Canute. Here's another coin of Canute. And we can see a sort of portrait of him here. And see uh, Canute uh, Rex again. Uh, the stock description of Canute is uh, the same uh, description of any good Christian king. He defended the weak, he exalted justice, he suppressed injustice. He was a friend and benefactor of the church. Uh, Canute's laws, uh, we could go on and on about Canute's laws. There's an analysis in Lawson, but he's, that's very Viking to pass laws, to have a law code. But it's in the tradition of Alfred. Remember that Alfred had collected all the laws and written laws too. So it's both English and Viking to do a law code. And Canute followed both traditions. There were some letters written on Canute's behalf in 1019 and 1020 and 1027, and a few charters and writs. Some of the late 11th and early 12th century accounts include Goscalin of Sambertan, who really is kind of important, and we can't spend much time with him, but he was a monk of Sambertan in Boulogne, in the, in the county of Boulogne, which was across the channel north of Normandy. And he wrote a lot of saints' lives, especially of English women. And so he's one of the candidates for having written some of these anonymous, uh, um, the encomium M.I. Regina and also the Vita Eduardi, the life of King Edward. He, he might have been the author of that. Osborne of Canterbury was also close chron chronologically. In Germany, Thitmar of Merseburg and Adam of Bremen were writing. William of Malmesbury wrote in 12th century England, uh, he wrote a lot later, but he's regarded as one of the most 
reliable historians in all of England, and uh, he he has a lot more material than you find in the earlier sources, which makes me suspicious. Um, I'm a little more suspicious of William of Malmesbury than most historians of England are. And we mentioned already William of Jumiege, who was a, a Norman who knew everything that was going on in England. He was writing a lot about England. Well, English churchmen and nobles elected uh, Canute, and they swore fidelity, and they, at the same time they rejected Ethelred's children, who at that time were in Normandy uh, with, their, uh, with their uncle, uh, Richard II, Duke Richard II. In return, Canute vowed to be a good lord in matters both church and lay, and this pledge was supported by the oaths of the Danish leaders. And the Chronicles report that he was elected by by the Londoners. Okay, last time we discussed the Witan, which was a sort of informal council of elders. And it appears nebulously here in all of these people who are choosing Canute. They appear to be a nebulous group of people that, that would be the Witan choosing Canute. He was crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Liffing, and this was all according to English tradition for the king, that the Archbishop of Canterbury would always crown the king. And his first coin shows him wearing a crown, and so he, he is very aware of his kingship. His, the first wife he married was Alfgifu of Northampton, and remember I told you that all the, all the queens are named Alfgifu. And she was the daughter of the E. Alderman Elfhelm. And so Elfhelm had been murdered in 1006 by E. Adric Striona. So it's very likely that Canute married her in order to get control of the north and solidify his control of the, of the north around Northampton. And here we can see Northumbria. Northampton is, is in this area of Northumbria. And so this would help him have control of the north. Um, okay. Uh, in 1017 and 1018, uh, Canute uh, collected an enormous tax, unbelievably huge, of 72,000 pounds plus 10,500 pounds from London to pay off his army. This was what this was their booty. This was their pay for conquering England. And then Canute divided the par the country into four parts in 1017. He kept Wessex for himself. Why do you think he kept Wessex for himself? Anybody guess why he kept Wessex for himself? That had been Alfred's kingdom, remember? And so, and so if you trace the kingship back to Alfred, then Wessex would be the place, the heart of English kingship. And so Canute kept Wessex. He gave East Anglia to Thorkel the Tall, who was one of those Danes who had been at the court of Ethelred. And he gave Mercia to Eadric Striona, the, uh, another of the Danes who was there, and Northumbria to Earl Eric of Lade, who then uh, um, married Canute's sister Githa. And Earl Eric of Lade is interesting because he had ruled Norway. He had been the, uh, what did I do? Oh, you have a question? Yeah. Didn't you say earlier that Eadric Striona was the same guy who killed his wife's father? Yes. That yes. didn't put any strain on the relationship? Um, it must have, but Eadric Striona, good question. I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, Eadric Striona is such an interesting character. I mean, he's just fascinating. If you go through and trace his career, he ends up getting killed. But, but he kept switching sides, and he betrayed everybody. And he was just, he was very Viking. He was out for his own interest, and he, he wasn't loyal to anybody. But, but um, Canute was on shaky grounds. That suggests he's on shaky grounds, that he has to reward Eadric Striona because he's worried about him rebelling against him. And so he had to solidify his power and placate Eadric Striona so he wouldn't um, join the enemies against him. Uh, but but Thorkel the Tall was, was pretty loyal after he switched sides that one time, and Eric, Earl Eric of Lade was a was a good supporter because Eric had ruled Norway also and uh, when he went to England to conquer England he left um, Norway in the care of his brother Swagen and his son Hakon until Swagen's death in 1015. 
But the reason that Canute organized the kingdom this way was probably to provide an interim military government and also to facilitate taxation because he was collecting that gigantic tax at the time. He also had to reward his followers and to control the countryside and, and anybody who was set on rebelling against him. So he picked what he felt were his most loyal followers. And so here we have those areas. We have Wessex going to Canute himself. Uh, see if I can remember all of these. Um, uh, let's see, Mercia went to Eadric Striona and um, East Anglia, which is relatively small, to um, Thorkel the Tall, and then Northumbria to Earl Eric of Laid, who was, would have been the most trustworthy of that group of people. And it was the largest part, too, that, that he got. Well, Canute lost control of Norway with the death of Eric of, of Laid's brother Swagen in 1015. And at that point, Olaf Haraldsson, who would be the future St. Olaf, became king of Norway. And Eadric Striona, surprise, surprise, was the, among the first to rebel against the king. And he was immediately caught by Earl Eric of Laid and beheaded in Christmas 1017. So that was the end of Eadric Striona after a, a very, um, uh, a, a very uh, scandalous career. Well, Ethelweird and Britric and many others were also executed for rebelling, and he also sent a lot of people into exile. And so the first thing he did was clamp down on anybody rebellious and kill or send them out of the country. And according to William of Poitiers, Canute cruelly slaughtered the noblest of England's, England's sons, young and old, to ensure his power. He banished others, like Eadwig, king of the Churls, who had led a peasant rebellion. And Eadwig was the son of Ethelred's first wife, Alfgafu, uh, before Emma. Um, at this point, um, Canute sent Edward and Edmund, who were the infant sons of Edmund Ironsides, to Sweden to be killed. Okay, but the king of Sweden surprised him and didn't kill them, so that's going to cause trouble later. But here we see, again, um, sending these sons to the king of Sweden and the connections with Eric of Laid and Norway, how really interconnected this Scandinavian world is at this time. It's interconnected even to the faraway realms of Russia and Hungary because the King of Sweden actually sent the, the, the children, um, Edward and Edmund, to the King of Hungary, who then raised them at his court. And they're called the Aethlings. Uh, and they were raised at the, at the court of the King of Hungary. Canute married Emma of Normandy, the widow of Ethelred II, probably to prevent her sons Edward and Alfred from gaining Norman military assistance and perhaps following Canute's agreement uh, with Duke Richard. Um, Edward, Alfred, and Godgifu were sent to Normandy, and Godgifu was the daughter. She is also known as Goda. So a lot, a lot of these people are known by several different names, but, uh, but uh, Godgifu uh, is really important. She plays an important role. Canute then married his sister Estrith to Richard's successor, Robert. So this would be Duke Robert of Normandy. And then Canute confirmed the liberties of Canterbury to Archbishop Liffing. And Canute and his brother Harold joined the Canterbury con Confraternity. That means they became part of the community of the Canterbury monks without actually becoming monks themselves but they, they join the community. This is a kind of odd thing, but uh, it happens in, in other places as, we, as well, uh, where the king associates himself with a particular monastery. Uh, at a meeting at Oxford between the Danes and the English, uh, a peace was made between them. And here is Emma, who, who married Canute. Canute, at, at the meeting at Oxford, with the advice of his counselors, quote, fully established peace and friendship between the Danes and the English, and put an end to all their former enmity, according to Wolfstan of York. In 1019, Canute sailed for Denmark and stayed all winter, and 
possibly deposed his brother Harold. The problem is all this stuff has to be pieced together and it's very difficult. Uh, what I've done here is try to work out a chronology for you in a much clearer way than Lawson does because he stops and argues every point. And so I tried to, I tried to give you a clearer chronology here. So Canute sailed for Denmark. He stayed all winter and perhaps deposed his brother Harold, king of Denmark adding Denmark to his own realm. In 1020, though, he outlawed Thorkel the Tall on the 11th of November. Uh, later, Thorkel was brought back into his friendship. But in 1022, Olaf Haraldsson, king of Norway, died, and his son, Anand Jacob, succeeded to Sweden. Now, how that happened, I'm not clear, but that's what Lawson says. And at this point, with, uh, with uh, especially Anand Jacob, Denmark came under serious threat. So in 1023, Canute was in Denmark again, making terms with Thorkel the Tall. He had to make peace with Thorkel. And Thorkel was unlike Eadric Striona. He was a pretty responsible man. And in the end, uh, Canute put him in charge of uh, his son, um, uh, Harold Harefoot. And so he, he, re he sent him to uh, Norway to rule with his son. And again, the closeness of this Norwegian world is, is really quite astounding, how closely connected all these different places are. Canute left Thorkel the Tall in charge of Denmark and exchanged hostages with him. Each one of them took the other one's son. And so what better hostage could you have? So Thorkel the Tall had Harold Harefoot at that time. Uh, when Canute went back to England, he brought with him Bishop Gerbrand of Roskilde and, um, to England, and there Canute made Gerbrand Bishop of Zealand as well. And so he brought one of the leading bishops of Denmark. Emma and Hartha Canute also uh, uh, patronized the church. They accompanied the relics of St. Althea from Rochester to Canterbury. Hartha Canute by this time was about five years old and Hartha Canute was Emma and Canute's son. And uh, according to the deal that Emma had worked out with, when she married him, uh, at least that's what the encomium says, uh, that Hartha Canute was destined to inherit the crown of, of England, that she had made this deal with Canute that their son would reign. Uh, saint Alfioth is an interesting saint. He was a former Archbishop of Canterbury who had actually been killed by the Danes who invaded the pagan Danes, had killed him by throwing cattle bones at him. They stoned him to death with cattle bones, which is an interesting way to die, because he wouldn't come up with a huge sum of money to buy them off. Um, so he became a martyr, and now his relics were held uh, holy in England. In 1025, Canute went to Denmark, and at the Battle of Holy River, Canute might have been defeated or not. It's unclear who won, but if he was defeated, it was probably by Anand Jacob of Sweden and Olaf of Norway, who would have been St. Olaf at that time. In 1026, now though Richard II, Duke of Normandy, died, and he was succeeded by his son, Richard III, who died within a year, in, in just a year. Richard III was, was only Duke for a year. And then his brother, Robert, uh, uh, gained the ducal throne and ruled from 1027 to, to 1035. It was Robert, remember, who had married Canute's sister, Estrith, and she must have been quite a handful because he divorced her very quickly and ended up taking a concubine who was who turned out to be the mother of William the Bastard. Uh, uh, the concubine was a tanner's daughter who he happened to see in a village and took a fancy to. Uh, here is, um, if we can see this uh, genealogy of uh, the Dukes of Normandy, uh, we have William, we have Rollo or Rolf, William uh, Longsword, Richard I, who married Emma and Gunnar, and then here is his daughter Emma, who married Canute and Ethelred, and um, 
then his son Richard II, whose son Richard III became Duke, and Robert, this would have been Robert I who became Duke, uh, the brother, and then um, through him, William the Conqueror is, uh, uh, actually, William the Conqueror was the daughter of Arletta, and uh, um, Robert, Duke Robert. Okay, and here you can see Emma's line with Edmund and Edward the Confessor, who becomes King Alfred, should be there too. Okay, Robert, Duke Robert treated the Aethlings, Edward and Alfred, with honor and adopted them as brothers and demanded that Canute restore them to kingship. So this is really interesting. He turned against Canute, and in 1027, uh, Canute then went to the imperial coronation of Conrad II in Rome on the 26th of March. At that very moment, he wasn't very concerned about what Robert was doing in Normandy because he himself was, be, was preparing to uh, uh, conquer a huge army himself. He was preparing to overthrow Olaf of Normandy, and he had already, in fact, claimed Olaf's throne by calling himself king of all England, Denmark, the Norwegians, and some Swedes. But he returned to England before launching his attack in order to put a great navy together and a fleet. And in 1028, he sailed from England to Norway with 50 ships and drove Olaf away. Um, Eric of Lade's son, Hakon, was with him, and uh, he paid off Olaf's men with as much as he could. And here is uh, the, the Holy Roman Empire, which he would have traveled through in order to get to Rome to attend the coronation. And this is looked at as a pilgrimage to Rome. My guess is he was more interested in being there at the imperial coronation than he was being there with the Pope of Rome. And we don't know a lot of the details of that, but he did make the friends with the Emperor Conrad II of Germany because he later on he um, arranged a marriage with his daughter to Conrad's son. Here is the imperial image that the emperors of Germany were just then portraying as themselves as an emperor of of, the, of all of Christendom. This is a, an imperial picture of the Emperor Otto III. And here is a picture of all the countries of Europe. Um, uh, this, this would have been um, Slavia, Germania, Gallia, and Roma would, would be the countries of Europe doing homage and bowing the knee to the Holy Roman Emperor. So the imperial image really appealed to Canute, and as we can see, that he was building an empire of his own at that time. Canute put Norway under Earl Hakon's control and entrusted Denmark to one of his own sons. Then in 1029, Canute returned to England and sadly, Earl Hakon drowned at sea, and Olaf returned and took Norway back. This is again St. Olaf. The following year in 1030, at the Battle of Stickelstad, Olaf was killed, and he changed, his name instantly changed from Olaf the Fat or Olaf the Stout to St. Olaf, and because he was regarded as dying for his country and a martyr, so he became a saint. At this point, Canute put his wife, Alfgafu of Northampton, and, and his son, Swagen, in charge of Norway. And uh, uh, he was still married to Emma, by the way. He just, you know, functioned with these two wives at the same time, uh, one in Norway and one in England. At this point, Canute's power was equal to that uh, that Swain Forkbeard had had in 1013. And he had created a North Sea Empire founded on political, military, administrative, and diplomatic skill. He adopted a crown at this time modeled on that of the German emperors, and he enjoyed wonderful relations with the Emperor Conrad II. And so he regarded himself as a kind of co-emperor. Here are the lands that he had at this point in his career when he equaled the empire of his father, Svein Forkbeard. He had Denmark, he had part of Sweden, he had Norway, 
he had all of England and so he had this North Sea Empire that revolved around the North Sea and he had allies in Frisia and in Normandy as well. Um, he betrothed his daughter Gunhild to Conrad's son Henry and then Canute expanded that empire even more. In 1031, he went to Scotland and received the submission of three kings, Malcolm II, Macbeth, and Ekmarkark Ragnelson. And these are respectively kings of Scotland, Moray, Firth, and Sutherland, and Galloway and Man. And so uh, Ekmar, Ekmarkark later became king of Dublin in 1036, and there's a lot of evidence that Canute held sway over uh, um, Ireland as well. There's evidence of Canute's activities in Ireland and Wales because King Citric Silkbeard, who had been king before Ekmarkok, modeled his coins after Canute's and may have actually witnessed three of Canute's charters. Archbishop Athelnoth of Canterbury consecrated the first Bishop of Dublin in Ireland, and Bishop Joseph of Landaff in Wales may also have been consecrated by Athelnoth. So we see, we see the influence of Canute expanding into um, Scotland and Ireland at this time. And so now we can enlarge his empire. We have the red part. Uh, the Scandinavian part that he acquired plus England and now his expansion in Ireland and Scotland. So he really had exceeded his father at this point and had a formidable empire assembled. The encomniast names Canute's dominions as England, Denmark, Norway, Britannia, and Scotia. And so this includes what Britannia means all the British Isles and Scotland. But now Duke Robert of Normandy got serious about pressing the claim of his cousins, Edward, uh, Edward and um, Alfred. And in 1033, Duke Robert of Normandy assembled a fleet to invade England and restore Edward to the throne. So William the Conqueror wasn't the first to have designs on England. His father also did. Canute then, at this point, offered to restore half of England and establish peace to Edward. And Edward then, in, in Normandy, um, well, Mont Saint-Michel is on the border of Normandy, Fécamp is in Normandy, but Edward then, at that point in 1033, witnessed grants to Mont Saint-Michel and Fécamp as king of the English. And so he considered himself king of England as well. His sister, Godgifu, married at some time Drew or Drogo, Count of the Vexan, which is a major part of Normandy, and um, had two children by him at that point who were major players in Normandy later on. It was in 1035 that Gunhild was betrothed to King Henry II of Germany, and the marriage actually took place in 1036. So Canute's daughter was married to the Emperor of Germany. But in 1035, having given up his attempt to conquer England, Duke Robert set out on pilgrimage for the Holy Land, and he died on the way back. And in that same year, Canute died in, on November 12th. And so the rule of England was sort of thrown open to anybody who might grab it. And here we have again our genealogy of the Normans. Here is Robert, who had just died in 1035. His son, William, as we saw last time, was only seven years old at the time. And so he had to scramble like mad with actually his uncles taking care of him who are not shown on this genealogy. Well, Edward immediately was poised to set sail for England, and he got there, and he defeated a large English force at Southampton. But he saw immediately that he didn't have enough people to really conquer England, and so he turned around and went back to Normandy. Meanwhile, his brother Alfred sailed from Wissant to Dover, and when he got there, uh, he, he and his men were, were actually put under arrest, and then um, Earl Godwin um, guaranteed his safety, but then he was treacherously murdered, and Earl Godwin was blamed for it. We don't know who was behind his murder. 
Um, my graduate student, um, Patricia Torpus, just uh, finished her dissertation on uh, the Godwin family um, last fall. She got her PhD, and it should be in the library soon if you're interested in the Godwin family. She's written that dissertation on, on it. Um, Harda Canute, who was the son of Canute and Emma, at age 17 was already king of Denmark, so he didn't want to leave Denmark. Um, Swigen, who was Canute's eldest son, was king of Norway with his mother, Alfgafu of Northampton. But Swigen died in 1034 after being expelled by Magnus Olaf's sons, and Magnus was the son of Saint Olaf. Um, Harold Harefoot, then, the son of Canute and Afkafu, was the only one left to succeed to England. So despite the deal that Emma had made, her son, Hartha Canute, did not want England. He, he wanted to stay in um, Denmark. And so Harold Harefoot was the only one left. Uh, the kingship was dispute, disputed by Hartha Canute's supporters, Earl Godwin and Emma, who were both in England really fighting for Hartha Canute. And it's strange that Godwin and Emma were allied at that point together, but they were trying to, it was a, it was a political power play. They were trying to get Hartha Canute in there as king. And here is Edward landing on the shore of England, and he's going to go back and then he'll return later on. Um, Hartha Canute was accepted at first as regent and in 1037 was recognized as king. Uh, the encomium reports that Archbishop Athelnoth refused to crown him. Oh, this is Harold Harefoot, who was accepted at first as regent in 1037 and then recognized as king, but Archbishop Athelnoth, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, refused to crown him. Uh, one of the problems was that, er that Canute had created a lot of very powerful earls who were mostly Danes. And other than the creation of these very strong earldoms, he ruled in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. He had become Christian, and he respected Anglo-Saxon customs. He issued dooms, he supported the church, and he won the vigorous support of the clergy by granting a lot of land and money to the churches and the churchmen. And he also gained the support of the church by keeping the peace. There were no civil wars in England during his entire reign, and so he was regarded as a peacekeeping king and a good king, especially compared to Ethelred. Uh, Mary sang the monks of Ely as Canute the king ro rode by, the monks of Ely reported. And so um, Canute was regarded as a very good king. But because he was also in charge of so many other realms, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and Ireland, and Scotland, he was obliged to delegate his authority, and he created those four large earldoms, uh, any one of which was in danger of becoming a center of power and rebellion against him. Remember, they were Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia and Wessex, ruled by earls now, and these are directly descended from the old Scandinavian institution of Jarl. You could immediately see that. Um, this is very different from Alfred's kingdom. Remember, in Alfred's kingdom, England was broken up into lots of tiny Ealder, Ealderdoms, where the Ealdermen ruled. And, and there were 20 or more E. Aldermen under England, so nobody could get a foothold of power. And under Canute, you had these four large earldoms, and here they are, Northumberland, Mercia, and Wessex, and East Anglia, which came to include this part as well. So those are the strong earldoms. Godwin of Wessex was the most powerful of the earls. He also had a herd at his court. This would have been Canute had a herd at his court. In England, they were called house carls, but it was actually a herd, just like the Scandinavians kings had. In England, the hundreds courts and the shire courts continued. The towns grew and prospered, and this increased the North Sea commerce. And so we have an explosion of trade and commerce. And 
and this is where I wanted this map, right here. <laughs> okay, and here is our map of the North Sea Commerce. Um, it, it's far greater than this map actually shows. This map is more concerned with the land routes, but there is just a beehive of activity tying the whole North Sea network together, which is making England enormously prosperous, and, as well as the rest of Scandinavia with the trading network and the growth of towns in England. Um, in 1036, however, uh, with the murder of the eighthling Alfred, Edward the Confessor's brother, uh, Godwin was blamed for that, whether he actually murdered him or not. And, and I wouldn't put it past Godwin to have carried out that murder. In 1040, Harold Harefoot died, and at that point, Hartha Canute became King of England. But Hartha Canute only ruled for two years, and in one of those years, actually, Edward the Confessor became co-king with him. And so Edward the Confessor and uh, Emma's son by Ethelred and Emma's son by a Canute called Hartha Canute ended up ruling together. Hartha Canute died very quickly. And, you know, we don't know why these, these men died. They're very young. They're young men in their teens, some of them not yet 20, both Harold Harefoot and Hartha Canute, and none of the records tell us how they died. Uh, very suspicious, given the murdering going on in England. So Edward the Confessor stepped into a literal snake pit of what was going on in England. It was a very, very dangerous. And he was brought in with the collusion of Earl Godwin, who was the most powerful of the earls, and the deal that Earl Godwin made with Emma. Interestingly, he was, he was crowned in 1043, and he brought with him a lot of Normans, naturally, because he was about, I don't know, 35 years old at this point, and he'd been raised in Normandy. He'd spent his whole life in Normandy hunting and playing and having a good time and, you know, being a lord, and he brought all these Normans with him. One of the most important was Robert of Jumiege, who he made Bishop of London. He brought another one named Ralph, who he made Earl of Hereford. He created another earldom for Ralph in Hereford with, and, and with Ralph's vassals. Emma and Godwin had made a deal that Edward the Confessor would rule. And here is Edward the Confessor arriving in England. And here he is being crowned King of England by the Archbishop of Canterbury here, the Archbishop of York joining in England's two archbishops. And here he is consulting with all his, his men, his bishops, his archbishops, and his Norman advisors. So this would have been the, the men at his court. In 1045, Edward married Godwin's daughter, Edith Godwin's daughter, uh, so that uh, he married Godwin's daughter. And uh, at that point, Magnus, uh, the son of uh, St. Olaf, uh, threatened to invade England. But when he died in 1047, that threat disseminated. Edward, one of the first acts that Edward made was to immediately banish Emma to Flanders. Um, his mother had dumped him in Normandy, had no contact with him, and apparently he was really angry with her, and so he, he took all her land and, and sent her packing to Flanders. Godwin, in the meantime, during the reign of Canute, he had really increased the size of his earldom to include Cornwall, Sussex, and Kent, and he had managed to put his sons in all, in all the other earldoms but one, and so the Godwin family controlled more land in England than the King of England himself. The Godwins were more powerful than the King as a whole family. And you were not surprised to know that they came to blows against each other in the crucial year 1051. What happened was Edward was able to, to control all his power, to bring all the power under his own control to appoint his own bishop, Robert of Jumiege, as the Norman Bishop of London and make him Archbishop of Canterbury. And the Archbishop of Canterbury was the most important 
archbishop or bishop in all of England. He was head of the English church. So now he had his ally, Robert of Jumiege, there in England. And here we can see the land controlled by the Godwins, Wessex, and all of this area here, East Anglia and Mercia and Northumbria. He had everything but a little bit of land over in here, which one other earl who was not a Godwin had. So the Godwins controlled all of England. And again, here is um, King Edward the Confessor with uh, his Normans at his court now controlling everything. And here he is at the height of his power in 1051 with his seal as King of England. On 26 March, the Count of Maine died, and the uh, Le Mans, the capital city of Maine, surrendered to the Count of Anjou at that point. Now, that was important because there were power struggles on the continent. There was an unsuccessful rebellion by Earl Godwin and his sons against Edward, and that is, I, I don't want to go into all the details of that, but it's so weird of what is going on there. It was sort of fomented by Eustace of Boulogne, who seems to have uh, uh, revved up the people of Dover uh, to uh, attack him, and they were supporters of the Godwins, and then there was a trumped-up incident where um, Edward the Confessor was able to throw the Godwins out because they refused to avenge the uh, uh, embarrassment of Eustace of Boulogne. And Eustace of Boulogne was clearly an ally of Edward the Confessor because it was at this point that he married Goda or Godgifu, the sister of Edward the Confessor, her first husband Drew having died. At this point, the Godwins were all sent from England into exile in Flanders. He got rid of the whole pack of them. Boulogne and Flanders, interestingly, were neighbors in Frisia. They were right by each other's sides, and they were rival powers. And both of them are interfering with England on different sides, as we can see. It was at this point in 1051 that Edward promised to William, uh, his young cousin, the succession to the Kingdom of England when he died. In summer to February of 1052, there was warfare between William the, uh, William the Bastard in England and the Count of Anjou around Domfront and Alençon. And here we can see the County of Maine, which is in turmoil here, the Counts of Anjou, which are powerful, and Normandy. This is Ponthieu, who, which is an independent earldom, and this is Boulogne here and if we look at this farther view on this map you can see the same kinds of places there here is normandy here is ponthieu this is boulogne and this is flanders and flanders is where all of these english exiles are going boulogne uh, the eustace of boulogne is allied with edward the confessor at this point and so we can see all these rival factions on the continent William the Bastard, in this very year, 1051, the crucial year 1051, this is the year he married Matilda, daughter of Baldwin V, Count of Flanders. And so you're seeing all of this, this rivalry come to a head with, with William the Bastard marrying Matilda, Count of Flanders. The next year, 1052, was also crucial. In the summer, there was an outbreak of the rebellion uh, of William Count of Arc rebelling against William the Bastard. In 15 August, the Count of Anjou allied with King Henry I of France. And in August, Earl Godwin and his sons, Harold and Leofwine, returned to England by force. And they literally brought a huge Viking army of Vikings and Flemish. And it was like they reconquered England. I mean, and, and uh, the English, they forced they forced themselves back in control in England, and after that, Edward the Confessor was never the same. They were reestablished in their earldoms, and at this point, they threw many of those Normans out of England, including Robert of Jumiege, who was the rightful Archbishop of Canterbury. And then they put in their own uh, candidate, uh, Stigand, who is given the Archbishopric of Canterbury, but it's illegal. It's illegal because you can't, when an archbishop, um, you can only have an archbishop succeed when another one dies. 
And so Robert was still Archbishop of Canterbury. Stigand was an illegal one. And then in 1053, on the 13th of April, Earl Godwin of Wessex died. Okay, and so his son, his oldest son, Harold, inherited Wessex and the head of the Godwin family. And so here we see Flanders, we see our, our map of Flanders and Boulogne and Normandy here. In June, the Battle of, of Kibitate took place in Italy, where the Italian Normans defeated Pope Nicholas II and became his vassals. And then in November or December, William the Bastard captured Ark. And December to January 1054, King Henry I of France invaded Normandy, the area of Evreu, while his brother Odo invaded eastern Normandy. Evreu is in central Normandy, and um, uh, uh, eastern Normandy is where the Battle of Mortimer took place, which William the Bastard then won, defeating the King of France. At an ecclesiastical council at Lisieux, with William present, uh, then he made a big ceremony of deposing Maguire, his uncle, the Archbishop of Rouen, and, and appointing a reformer, Maurilius. Uh, meanwhile, Earl Seward, who was the one non-Godwin uh, Earl of England, died as Earl of Northumbria, and so uh, an infant uh, inherited, and the Godwins were even more powerful. In 1055, Robert, William's half-brother, became Count of Mortain in Normandy, and I want to show you some of these places in Normandy. Here is Mortain, where uh, William's half-brother was Count um, here was the here was Lisieux where the church council took place. Here is Evreu where um, Henry the First invaded, and here is Mortimer where William defeated Henry the First brother. Um, uh, here and we're going to see another battle in Vatteville up here in a moment. Here is uh, William's brother. Uh, Robert, who becomes Count of Mortain, and this is his other brother, Odo, who was Bishop of Bayeux in Normandy. In 1056, Henry I of France and the Count of Anjou became allies, and Henry invaded Normandy again and was defeated at the Battle of Vereville. The eighthling Edward, son of Edmund Ironsides, returned to England from, from Hungary with his children Margaret, Edgar, and Christina, and died shortly after his arrival. Then, on the 30th of September, Leofric, Earl of Mercia, died, and um, in December, Ralph the Timid, the Norman Earl of Hereford, died. In 1057, Malcolm III Canmore became King of Scotland, and Magnus, son of Harold Hardrada, king of Norway, attacked England. Uh, 1058 was the Synod of Melfi, which was an alliance between the Italian Normans and the Pope. So this is just giving you all of this background. And here we have our counties again in this area. In 1059, on the 4th of August, uh, King Henry the of France died and was succeeded by Philip I, a minor. In 14 November, Count Geoffrey of Anjou died, and in October, Alexander II became Pope. And you'll all remember that Alexander II was the student of Lanfranc, who was William the Bastard's right-hand man and head of the Church of Normandy at that time. Now, Herbert Count of Maine died in 1061, and William invaded and conquered Maine. And Walter, the new Count of Maine, and his wife Biota died. In the following year, Harold Godwinson visited Normandy, and uh, uh, William and Harold together uh, invaded Brittany and fought a battle against Brittany. And at that time, Harold became the man of William the Conqueror, uh, William became William the Bastard. William became his lord, and Harold swore homage and fealty. Another ecclesiastical council was held at Lisieux, and meanwhile in England there was a revolt in Northumbria, and Earl Tosti Godwinson was sent into exile. But in 1065, Edward the Confessor died. 
and the oldest son of Earl Godwin, who had inherited everything, was Harold Godwinson. He was elected King of England by the Witan. And here we'll just sort of skip over this map again where we can see all of this area. This is the area of Paris. That's all the King of France controlled, by the way. In 1066, Harold Hardrada invaded England through York and was defeated magnificently at the Battle of Stamford Bridge by King Harold. And meanwhile, William the Bastard had been biding his time in Normandy, building a fleet, waiting for the winds to change, and maybe he was. At least he said he was waiting for the winds to change. Interestingly, the moment he heard that Harold, uh, that King Harold had to march northward and fight this terrific battle with Harold Hardrada and defeat him in the north of England, it was at that moment that he jumped on his ship and announced that the winds had changed and they all set off for Normandy when the king was being weakened. Very suspicious circumstances. He invaded England and uh, uh, supposedly in one battle at the Battle of Hastings conquered the whole country on the 14th of October, 1066. Well, some people think that this sail across the channel of this huge fleet of William the Bastard, who now became William the Conqueror, was the last great Viking raid. And there's lots of testimony that can prove that. And we're going to look at all of that when we look at the Bio Tapestry, one of the most very important sources of this period, one of the most important of all sources. And we'll look at that after the break. So let's take about a 10-minute break and see you in a few minutes.